Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another live Perceptive podcast here on the Game Wisdom YouTube channel. If you're watching this recorded, we are recording this ju- or we're streaming this just before the uh, Christmas break takes over the United States. Joining me once again is noted game economist Ramin Shokazad, and we are going to be talking about monetization in free to play games tonight. Ramin, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, and thank you. It's always a pleasure to come on your show. Yep, and it's always great to talk to you as well. We've spoken twice so far. I'm sure we'll be talking more in the future. But we're going to be recording this, or I'm sorry, we're streaming this live again just before the holidays. So for you guys watching this recorded, it'll probably be about a week or so. So I guess, I mean, do you have any plans for the holiday season before we get going? Um, I'm driving down to... Uh... Austin to see friends down there that I haven't seen in a while, and uh, I actually have maybe some final interviews down there, so I'm pretty excited. Nice. It's a, I guess it's a busy time for everyone. I got finished working on my book idea and getting ready for some radio uh, presentations in January, so uh, good luck to you there, and we'll see how things, hap- I guess, turn out in the new year. Yeah, but, so uh, today sounds like we got a hot topic. Mm-hmm. Yes, we're only talking about monetization in free-to-play games. And this is, again, another one of those topics we could probably spend a few hours on easily. But we're going to be probably taking this to about 4 o'clock our time, which is about an hour and 10 in terms of the stream. So this will be, I guess, relatively late for both of us there in terms of time. But... Free to play in mon- I'm sorry, monetization in free to play games is always a very tricky thing. Last time we focused more on the mobile side, talking about games that are built for that platform. But as we're both well aware, we've also well we've obviously seen a huge spike in terms of free to play games among PC games, and we've even seen I think a few of them at least in the small scale oh, excuse me small scale on the console side, and. When we're talking, I guess here's my first question for you, Ramin. With what you've done in terms of your work and talking to various developers, is there a different perception in terms of the free-to-play attitude among like PC and console versus the mobile or social gaming side? Hmm. Well, I would say that in the console environment, it's typically typically the case where they have a lot of background making. Uh, retail console games and very little experience doing free to play so usually they're just dabbling for the first time Mm -hmm. and uh, don't really know how to go about it in the PC environment it's it's it can be uh, fairly similar because free to play is still fairly new on the PC platform you see a lot more experience working with free to play in the mobile and social environments though in the mobile and social environments usually the the approach is very much data-driven design instead of creative design so you get um, you get games that feel very mathematical and very repetitive but they don't really um, they don't really feel as much like their games Mm -hmm. yeah and I mean we talked about that last time regarding the mobile side of things like I know on our first cast as well together that a lot of the mobile games tend to just all like blur together in terms of their design uh, UI elements and of course their monetization tactics. Well, if you're going to use data-driven design, mm-hmm. uh, that works because you're you're using <laughs> data you've gathered before, which almost certainly means you're using uh, design elements you've used before. So it, it just it 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 strongly encourages copying if you're approaching with the data-driven design because data-driven design uh, absolutely will not tolerate the application of something you don't have data for, which means you can't create anything new and add it to your game. Mm -hmm. Now, I think what's very interesting in terms of the state of like the free-to-play side of things when it comes to monetization is that for the PC games or the PC uh, platform, the first, I think, really big examples of free-to-play design would probably be something like Team Fortress or League of Legends. Were there any games that came before those that went the free-to-play route? Or if you can think of any, Ramin? 
well, if you want to go into Asia where it oh, started, yes. then you go all the way back to Maple Story in 2001. Mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> a lot of games after that that use the same model. Mm -hmm. I guess with that transition from like the Asian markets with Maple Story to the United States, when we saw like again like the big sides with Valve and Riot, how does how did Maple Story I guess differ in terms of its free to play design when it was pitched to uh, PC gamers, or was it different at all from when we look at more of the modern examples? Well, Maple Story started on PC. Uh, this was before we really had mobile gaming. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea there was, well, uh, even though when we may have like a certain price point in it for games in the West, but in the in the Asia at the time, and, and it's changed. I think we talked about this in one of our previous podcasts. The, the, the disposable incomes or disposable budgets for games for, for players in Asia were typically lower. And so to get them into it, uh, they had to lower their price point. So the idea was, well, let's just lower it to zero and put some things in there so that the people, at least the people who can pay, will pay. And it wasn't until they started realizing that they could, they could uh, force spending with these pay-to-win elements that they suddenly realized that people spend a lot for this. And, and so it very quickly became a, a pay-to-win uh, model and with just a few people spending a lot in order to beat the people who weren't spending. Mm -hmm. And what is the state of Maple Story like today? Is it still going strong? Has the uh, player base dipped at all? I, I can't honestly say I've been following uh, okay. Maple Story 16 years after its launch, but uh, I would say that uh, Nexon is, is, has been reporting a, a really strong sales with their uh, uh, lineage to related products that they've been distributing, especially their new uh, mobile game. Yeah, and as you said, I mean, especially in the Asian markets, we have seen a huge explosion of free-to-play based titles over the last decade. Probably even more than that at this point. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of PC gamers tend to make fun of just all the crazy uh, games we see, very sexualized titles that come out of the Asian markets. <laughs> in the free to play space. I mean, when I used to do ads, when I used to have ads up on Game Wisdom, there were several, I used to get those <laughs> specific games on my board. I'm like, oh, well, that's just great. <laughs> yeah, a year or two ago, they started, uh, someone came up with a, uh, an animation model to independently oh, track no. women's breasts yeah. so that each breast could move independent of the other <laughs> in a more, I guess, the, you might say physically natural way, but it didn't look very natural to me. Uh, but I guess that was big in Asia, so mm -hmm. that was like the hot thing for a while. Was, now, one... you know, here, here we have hats in the West. There they yeah. have boobs. <laughs> if only someone <laughs> could combine the two, they'll have the ultimate free-to-play <laughs> game right there. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, one thing that I thought was very interesting, and this could probably be its own topic for a cast, but it deserves to be mentioned here, is that we've seen cases where uh, a free-to-play or popular PC game in the United States gets translated into a uh, Asian-based free-to-play title over there. And it's usually handled in like very unique ways. Like I know, I remember seeing like Battlefield, for instance, was ported to I think I want to say Nexon or Tencent made the free-to-play version of Battlefield for China. And I was just wondering if you've done any research or looked at when those games get translated over to China or to the Chinese-based markets, like. What do they do to kind of make it friendly for that audience compared to when it's over here? They put a lot of gotcha into it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do they do like anything else? Are there any other like specific trends, or is it just really more focusing on like loot box and pay to win? I would say the the more popular one, the ones that, the most successful ones do. Uh, active daily events that are actually moderated so they're a little different every day mm -hmm. so the people can expect if they log in something new will happen and, and it's less predictable mm -hmm. and I guess we don't, really, we don't really moderate that so much in the west it's not the same thing but there they have just thousands of people who that's what they do is they do microtransaction live events and moderation mm -hmm. and I guess 
in terms of their numbers, like how well do those games do compared to uh, games that were built originally for the Asian markets? Like, has I, there been any studies? Or I no? don't think I have data on that. Okay. Uh, you know, all that stuff is so um, is pretty tightly guarded, mm-hmm. and a lot of the times these these types of games have short lifespans, uh, but they just copied pretty rapidly. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, now, uh, getting back to things in the United States, as we said, Maple Star is one of the first big hits in terms of free to play, and then from the United States side. When most of us think about free to play or when that market really took off, we probably think of Team Fortress and, of course, League of Legends. So, I guess for you, Ramin, I'm sure you have done studies and you've written about both those games considering their impact. What did you, I guess we'll start with uh, Team Fortress. What did you make of Valve taking Team Fortress and moving into the free to play side of things? Well, I have to admit that free to free to play in the first person shooter genre mm-hmm. is probably my my weakest mm-hmm. subject. Okay. Uh, I can't say that I specifically studied each of them because in my case, uh, I find it uncomfortable to play um, photorealistic shooters. Mm-hmm. So I have a, a a a relative blind spot there, even though I know it's a popular topic. Okay. Uh, and for me, the real the real noticeable uh, surge in free to play in the West. Uh, focused around um, Farmville, which probably mm-hmm. would actually predated those those other two titles. And uh, in my case, I don't really have also don't really have a young male centric view of gaming. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't always just focus on the the games that are played exclusively by young men. I'm looking at uh, cross gender types of games, including things like Farmville. Okay. Uh, let me see. Yeah, it looks like Team Fortress 2 was released, well, originally released in 2007, but of course the free-to-play transition didn't happen until many years later. But, uh, in terms of being released originally for free-to-play, League of Legends certainly struck that chord with people. I guess, did you do any research into League of Legends or the MOBA scene? I think League of Legends was starting originally around, what, 2009? And, uh... I'm gonna look it up real quick. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's my see. memory. Uh, but it mm-hmm. took them a while to really get profitable with it. Mm-hmm. They had to they had to tweak it quite a bit. Uh, but I think they did a really good job of tweaking it because they really tried hard to limit the appearance of of pay to win mm-hmm. in the game. So most of the the things that they're selling are what I call meta game buffs, mm-hmm. which means they're things that affect uh, your performance in the meta game. In other words, things that happen between matches instead of actually in the match. Hmm. Uh, whereas if you could, if you had a buff that you could just apply in the middle of the match that would give you a big advantage, that would make it pay to win, and uh, mm-hmm. I think that would have a suppressive effect on spending. Uh, and they didn't do that to their credit, and I think that's part of the big reason why they've been so successful. Hmm. Now, last time when we spoke about pay-to-win and monetization in game design, we brought up about if the player is allowed to buy any kind of advantage or able to essentially spend money to get to the same place that I would have to spend in game time to, that you felt that was more on the pay-to-win side. So with League of Legends, you feel that even though you can essentially buy buffs in that game, the last time I played, I know they had stuff like experience buffs or in-game currency buffs. Because none of that impacts the actual game experience, you feel that kind of stays more on the ethical side of free-to-play? Yes, absolutely. Okay. I think that's It very... also makes it much more uh, eSports friendly. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, you can't play, a, you can't have a real game of chess if one person's getting extra moves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. (laughs) (laughs) And that's very interesting when we look look at the greater scheme of free-to-play monetization, that League of Legends, and even by extension, of course, something like Dota 2, would be those games where you're not really buying anything that directs the actual in-game experience. And that is a huge contrast, of course, to what we talked about last time, 
with the mobile games and of course what we see in AAA games that use microtransactions where their whole monetization scheme is that you are literally buying loot boxes, you are buying higher quality chances for power-ups and the like. Well, I think the the pay-to-win model is a, just one kind of free-to-play, and I would describe it as the oldest and mm-hmm. least effective model in play. But it's still probably the most commonly used model. Yeah, of course. And as we talked about last time, that uh, the power curve or the allure of it is a incr- extremely effective motivator to get someone to play. I think you use the term. I want to say you said egocentric, but I think you said something else in terms of, you know, getting people to buy into this gotcha. I probably did use the term egocentric. I think I went as far as to use the word narcissistic yeah. in one of my recent papers uh, because you're, you're trying to elevate one player above everyone else, mm-hmm. possibly with the purpose of having that player get attention from other people. And it really plays in well to the narcissistic personality. And so you would expect uh, players that might be uh, uh, experiencing either borderline or full-blown <laughs> narcissistic personality disorder to be much more uh, uh, have a much harder time resisting that model. Mm-hmm. And when it works, it... and the and the and the conversion rates mm-hmm. for pay-to-win are almost identical to the uh, the population uh, NPD rates. Mm-hmm. Yep. And as we said <laughs> last time, maybe a coincidence, but I don't really think so. <laughs> yeah. And as we said last time, when it works, it can create that virtual arms race, and it can be extended indefinitely, as long as you can just keep adding in new weapons or raising stat values, and people are willing to pay. It keeps going and going and going. I think most people, I mean, uh, statistically, 95% of the people or more uh, don't get hooked on that cycle. Uh, but the ones that do, which again, I suspect a link to uh, to narcissism, which is uh, supposedly skyrocketing in society now, uh, makes people with those types of personality traits more vulnerable to the model. And since we now have the ability to identify these people uh, based on just the what they like on Facebook, for instance, their 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 user behavior on Facebook. We can actually identify who those people are and target them with advertising to get them in our game preferentially. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, going back to the idea of like paying for advantages and stuff along those lines, like with the League of Legends model. One thing that I've heard people complain about before is the fact that you're able to buy, of course buy new champions, get them quicker, and there have been a lot of fans who've complained to Rai about how these champions have to be rebounds, you know, they release them first to, you know, get people to buy them immediately, and then they'll nerf them or downgrade them to normality, like, after, like, a few weeks or when the, you know, that new character sheen has faded away. And, you mean they have to buff? They have to nerf them because the new character was actually made overpowered, yeah. so people would be forced to buy it, mm-hmm. and then they buff it back down to normal. Yeah, I guess so. so they can do the same thing with the next generation of characters. Mm-hmm. Now, do you feel? I guess would that be considered at all like pay to win or a different kind of pay to win, or would that be like a different example of monetization? No, that, that's that's pay to win. I mean, if you introduce a new microtransaction that gives you an unfair advantage, that's totally pay to win. Mm-hmm. It, it, even if it's yeah. not an advantage, but it's just perceived as an advantage, that's all it takes. Mm-hmm. Now, I guess a quick question for you, I mean, have you looked at the game Path of Exile by any chance? Somewhat, and I've talked to the developer there. I believe they're in Australia. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, The reason why I brought that up, for those of you watching Live Record who don't know, Path of Exile is a free-to-play ARPG. I think it was released, I want to say at least two to three years ago, but I'm sure it's been longer than that. Let me see if I can... Yeah, it it feels like longer than that at this point. It's it's a very Diablo-looking game, Mm -hmm. but it has a more complex economy. Yeah, it was released according to Google in October of 2013, so they've been going for quite a while. And one of the major 
uh, marketing points for Path of Exile is that it is is completely free to play in terms of its game based content. Anything that's going to be like new dungeons, new characters, anything along those lines is free. And then everything in terms of monetization has to do with cosmetics and elements that don't directly impact playing the game in the sense of like new inventory spaces, um, better chances, stuff like that. I guess that's a quick question for you. I mean, in terms of like those kinds of, I like to call them quality of life improvements. How do you find those in terms of monetization or monetizing them to the player? Well, when you talk about quality of life improvement, it's kind of a tricky thing because yeah. uh, uh, the implication is that you the default state is a poor quality of life, mm -hmm. and and that's been intentionally designed into the, into the game. So if you you uh, design the default play experience to be uncomfortable for the player. Uh, and then they have to pay to have a comfortable experience, then that could be like kind of bordering on threat generation to try mm -hmm. to force people to spend. Yeah. And it's always tricky to get that balance because as a developer, you want people to spend money in your game. If no one's spending it, it's not going to last a long time. But <laughs> how do you balance, I guess, these two polarizing forces between your making experience that will pull people in, but also having enough, I guess, um, I guess, will room or enough uh, line out there to entice people to spend? Well, it, it there's tremendous pressure mm -hmm. on developers to force yes. their players to spend. And this, for me, is completely a dark side if you go down that path. But that's the easiest path to go mm -hmm. down. It requires the least skill and experience on the part of developers. So it's by far the most common approach to free-to-play. And it's what gives free-to-play such a bad name. Uh, but uh, to, to use uh, more subtle and effective methods requires quite a bit more experience of free-to-play. And since that experience is very limited in industry still, even after a number of years now, uh, you just don't see it uh, occurring very often. Mm -hmm. Yep, and right now I'm looking at... Uh, Path of Exile store, what they have available on the website itself. And you can see that while there aren't any gameplay related content or gameplay changing microtransactions, everything else in terms of the play experience or the cosmetic side is up for grabs. Like to give you a quick example, I'm seeing of course stash increases or inventory spaces, I'm seeing armor effects, weapon effects, there's even f uh, footprint effects of little graphic trails that can happen as you're walking, too. And all this, again, uh, these options, can I believe, they cannot be obtained in-game by playing. They're only available through their in-game or the store. But, of course, you're not able, they're not going to be changing how you're playing the game. Right, well, uh, I have to say that I have a good relationship with the developer for Path of Exile, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I consider them one of the good guys. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I certainly don't want to sit here and try to you know, nitpick their design, uh, but, but generally I'd say that the, in many cases the, the inventory space thing has been uh, abused in mm -hmm. games uh, because they'll start you with such a small yes. space that you really can't go very far. Um, but Again, it's just a matter of well, you know, how serious do you want to, to get about the game? It's just a, if, if if they're saying, well, we're going to let you play, you know, it's it's basically a, a non-transparent way of saying we're going to let you play for the first ten hours for free, and then the game is going to get increasingly uncomfortable for you until you fork up some money. Yeah. Um, because otherwise, you just won't be able to effectively participate if you don't have enough inventory space. Mm-hmm. And I can give you an example of that. When I played DC Universe Online, after they did the free-to-play transition, one of the things they did was when you start playing the game as a free player, not only do you only you have a very small inventory, but there is a literal currency limit of how much in-game currency you could hold on your character. But the problem was, no matter how well you spent your money, you were always going to go over through quest rewards or selling items. 
and if you sold an item and you were at your limit, you were essentially throwing money out the window. Mm. So what I had to do to try and keep that was I basically had to hoard all my inventory items, basically kind of, you know, it's kind of like holding uh, gold reserves in a sense, so that I would spend all my in-game currency, and then when I needed to buy something, I would sell those items back for more currency. But I had to make sure to never go over that inventory limit. Right. Well, I, I describe that's what I call re uh, reward removal, mm -hmm. where you give somebody something and then take it away right after you gave it to them. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the the key uh, techniques that I listed in my well-read uh, top secrets of free-to-play paper from 2013. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was, I, I mentioned back then that it was also used very effectively in in Puzzle and Dragon, and uh, uh, and again, it's I, I consider it a, a dark side technique. Uh, um, but I love talking about dark side dark mm -hmm. side techniques since I don't personally use them myself. Uh, and uh, when you, in this case, that they're giving you the money. But then, uh, uh, but then they're taking it away again by having it lost if you don't expand your capacity to, to hold the money. Mm -hmm. uh, you see this quite a lot in uh, all, in for instance, Clash of Clans and all the clones of Clash of Clans, uh, where you have to, you know, um, you, you at some point you end up having a lot more income than you can actually store the resources. Uh, it becomes quite tricky, so. Uh, a lot of times, it's just a, a, an incentive to either pay to increase the size of your your storage, which uh, if you don't pay, it can take days or even more than a week to build these one buildings up. Mm -hmm. um, and it, and then there's also incentive to just instantly build things that way because you don't you don't have to worry about what whether there's a cap or not. You can say, oh, hit instant build. Yep. And in terms of that reward removal. Um, I remember playing Age of Empires online. This was the free-to-play game from, uh, I believe, Gas Power did it first, and then Robot, or could have been Vice, uh, could have been Switch around in terms of developers. So I know they changed uh, about halfway through that game's lifespan. And one of the more popular things they did was they would give you a quest reward of a rare or higher quality item for your Civ, and then turn around and say, oh. If you don't, if you don't buy access to this civilization, you don't have premium access. You can't use this item. Um, I, as far as I know, I know of two studios that uh, worked on that: Hidden Path and uh, Gas Powered. And there, I think there were there were multiple studios that worked yeah. on that title. It was kind of a, uh, uh, I know that that game got around. Is all I yes. can say. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I remember just keeping an eye on that and just seeing how many times they tried to change things around. And that, I think, is a really good uh, topic that I want to turn to, or we could probably spend like the remaining of our time here talking about, when you're kind of having to add these monetization aspects to your free-to-play game and what you do. But uh, there's one last quick uh, topic I want to talk about in terms of these tactics and strategies that designers use. And... That is something that I've been seeing a lot more in the mobile space, but I'm sure, I'm pretty sure there must be examples of this in free to play games. And that's the idea of the VIP customer or the VIP access. You see oh. this in, I'm sure you probably have oh. seen this on VIP, your end. VIP gets crazy in Asia. Yes. Oh my God. Some of the Chinese games I used to play with the VIP was just. It's just amazing how much you had to spend to get up into those VIP levels. Yes, and uh, for those of you watching this, either live or recorded, don't know what we're talking about. VIP, or the VIP status for a lot of these free-to-play mobile games, is essentially, it reminds me a lot of the uh, currency cards or the VIP spenders in casinos, wherein if you spend enough money, you get points which can raise your level up. Which, for the casino side, this is used for comps or getting more points and stuff like that. But for mobile games, it's simply used to give you extra advantages. Such as, let's say, I beat a level or I do something, I get one treasure chest or one gotcha. If I'm a VIP, I could get two or three. Or it gives me higher income rates, lets me uh, auto speed or 
auto pass through watching stuff is essentially a way of quote unquote rewarding someone by giving them more access. But of course, it keeps requiring them to spend real money to do so. A lot of money. Of yes, of course, a lot of money. I mean, the the for some of those like the lowest like the VIP level one, the very introductory level mm -hmm. was you can get you to get in there. You'd have to spend two thousand dollars a year, mm -hmm. and then the higher levels would be over ten thousand oh. dollars for a year. And uh, and and they even promised uh, live support. Like an actual customer service, if you were a VIP, so you could you could call in and a, a, a young woman would would answer and help you with whatever problems you're having in the game. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, thankfully, uh, I guess for me, I haven't seen that example at least with the mobile games I've played, at least the ones that are U.S. based. But I guess for you, Rami, or what you looked at, how popular is that as an incentive for free to play people? Well, you know, when you're in Asia and say when you're when you're when you're at home in the West and you're playing in your room and no one sees you, there's not this much peer pressure. But when you're playing in the East and you're playing in an internet cafe and there are dozens of people there that you know that are watching you play, it becomes a a, a form of conspicuous consumption. It's a way of showing off your wealth, and uh, especially in China where. Uh, it, it, there's, there's not that. It's really hard to attract a, a partner, uh, and and people go to extreme lengths to to attract partners, like you know, buying a very expensive apartment in Beijing or, or such, in order to prove that you would make a good husband. Uh, there's a there's a tremendous amount of pressure to to peacock, to show off that you have money, and this is one of the ways they do it. I mean, in the West it might be a fancy car or something. Uh, but in the East, it could literally be uh, becoming a, v a VIP in one of these games. Mm. And that peacocking is certainly, I mean, that is a major uh, monetization tactic for a lot of free-to-play and microtransaction-based games over here. I mean, how many games these days allow you to buy new color palettes or new capes? I think that was something in uh, DC Universe or new outfits and whatever to really make you stand out right but it's nothing compared to knowing that that the guy at the, the in the last chair on the third row in their internet cafe is a is a vip mm -hmm. and that in a, and if like it, if you want to play that game you should talk to that guy because he's the vip but even if you don't care if you just want to know somebody who who has money you know that that's the guy mm-hmm and I am very sure that in these games, they make it pretty easy to see who's a VIP in game and who's not. Oh yeah, I'm sure it's usually displayed front and center, <laughs> so you know, you know immediately because of the number of stars or whatever uh, mm -hmm. on their name, what VIP level they are. Mm -hmm. And as you said a few minutes ago, I mean that for those kinds, for the Asian-based uh, versions of this, it requires consistent spending. Like it's not just I spend fifty dollars, I'm VIP forever. It requires you to keep putting money in, like on a month by month or year by year basis. Yes, and you, you see the same thing in in the West uh, in dating applications. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to be like a you know the the platinum member, uh, it gets really expensive. But that's a way of just uh, showing off your wealth. To potential uh, dating partners. Mm -hmm. And as we said, this can be, or this is a very highly effective way to get people to play these games or to get access. I guess, as a quick, uh, not sure this is a complete tangent, but in terms of what VIP offers, you of course said uh, it could be live support, uh, enhanced cosmetic options. Are there any popular in-game options, or I guess gameplay affecting options, that are used for VIP status? You mean as far as what type of benefits it gives yes. you? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, yes. I mean, you might get. Uh, it, there may be a uh, event that occurs once a day in a game, and you can do it multiple times at higher VIP levels, or uh, timers take less time, mm -hmm. or uh, every time you spend, you actually get a discount. Uh, if you're at a higher VIP levels, uh, maybe even like if you have ships that move around, they may move faster. 
uh, which could give you a huge advantage if you're trying to to get to some place before someone can react. Uh, there's just there's just almost a, an infinite number yeah. of advantages they can give you, and they they make them a little bit stronger every on every VIP level to the point where, at some point, uh, you know the the, the advantages are massive. Mm-hmm. And as you said, or as we talked about already in this cast in our previous talks, when you're offering power as an incentive to buy, it can it really attracts people or it attracts that mentality especially the whales who will spend that money to get those powerful advantages. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I know we have about, I think, 40 minutes left, maybe a little bit less than that for our talk today. So I think we can probably start discussing what it means to add monetization microtransactions to free-to-play games. This will kind of go back to what we were saying, or what I was starting to talk about with Age of Empires Online, I think this will probably take us to the end for today. And I'm sure if we somehow still have time, there's probably any number of other topics we can jump off into. But one of the major parts of games as a service, I know we probably spent a little bit of time with this last time, is having to keep adding microtransactions into video games. And we were just talking about this on Skype before we came on to talk live, but for a lot of the free-to-play games out there that try to keep going in terms of games as a service and adding microtransactions, a lot of them, in terms of you know what's out there and what's currently available, tend to fail. I mean, we can easily bring up a few examples in a few minutes, but I guess for you, Rob, and what you've looked at, what makes these games tend to fail when they're trying to add microtransactions or monetization to their games? Well, usually these 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 games typically start as either subscription or retail games, mm-hmm. and they were that way because there was no one on staff who knew how to do uh, what they wanted to do as a free-to-play game. So they just went ahead and used that model, even though they could see free-to-play gaining strength, uh, especially in the East. Uh, so at some point, if, if they started on the subscription model, uh, let's talk about that primarily. The subscription model is basically, uh, since you're paying one fee for the whole month, you, uh, it's, it's kind of like a, an all-you-can-eat buffet. Yes. You can, you can play it as much as you want during that month for the same price. So the incentive is to come in and binge feed so you'll see games that launch under the subscription model, and for the first few days or weeks, people just play all day. They just go crazy. And and by the time the first month is over, <laughs> they've played through pretty much all the yeah. content. And then they just uh, they lapse their subscription, or, or maybe the one month came with the, uh, with the game when they bought it. They get one month free, and then they have to, to pay for additional months. Well... It, they saw the content, and so they'll tend to just uh, lapse their subscriptions after that. So if the, the idea was you were going to make money on a subscription basis, that's good for the first month. But unless you have some way of, of creating content that's perpetual, then your subscriptions drop off rapidly, and it becomes a, a loss to continue to operate the game. Mm-hmm. Um, as a really good example of that would, once again, be <laughs> DC Universe Online who I yes. still remember <laughs> yeah, their interview saying, we're going to release expansion-level content every month to keep people invested. They got, I think, like a month, maybe two months in, and then they just couldn't keep up. Because when you're... Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure we've talked about this before, but I know I've talked about this to someone. You, It is very hard to keep making high-quality content, especially at that rate. It's why we typically see expansions or new content take usually like six months to a year to see like actual massive improvements like that. Right, and with DC Online, uh, John Smedley decided he would convert that to free-to-play. And after he did, he was posting articles bragging about how he had like a 600% increase in revenue after he went to -to free-to-play. But what he meant was, I had a 600% increase in revenue the first month after I went to free to play. Mm-hmm. And after that, he did talk about what his revenue yes. were. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. Because people, you know, who were going to buy whatever they were forced to buy when they switched to uh to free to play, uh bought it and then didn't buy anything else. Yeah. 
and then it just becomes and then it basically changes or let's talk about that for a second like as we said when it comes to the subscription model your goal as a designer is to keep that content coming to keep people spending the ten dollars or twelve dollars or whatever a month so that that's so that the value remains but when you switch your game over to free to play and that you know extra large purchase is no longer available or is no longer possible what then becomes your goal as a designer to keep people invested in your game well i mean these many of the games we're talking about that were originally retail that were converted to free to play are basically story based games you you know, like just let's use World of Warcraft, for example, you you start off, you know, it teaches the story of the world, and you're progressing through levels. And at some point, you hit the max level, and maybe there's some end game content you play over and over <laughs> and over again because you played through the story. Yeah, it, it's it's finite, uh, and 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 the only thing that's going to keep a game like that going possibly is the social interaction because the content gets old. And that's why uh, World, of War World of Warcraft actually succeeded on the social level, so it, it worked. But um, uh, but the games that do well uh, long term in free to play do not use that type of story, that finite story type of, of mode. Instead, they might use, uh, for instance, a more like an esports approach, mm -hmm. where the content is the unpredictability of your opponent. So you see this in League of Legends, you see this in World of Tanks, where even though you've done, you know, you know maybe in World of Tanks you've done a tier 6 battle hundreds of times, but not against the opponents you're going to face today. So it, that means it's always fresh. Yes. Uh, so that's that's one way you could approach uh, trying to keep it keep it um, you know, keep it keep it going and without uh, you know, having to add content all the time. The other way is to have the users themselves generate the content. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't see that as much in, we see it in some games, I think especially some uh, some free, uh, some first person shooters, but the, but mostly where we, the type of interactive media where we see that type of content generation is social networks like Facebook and uh, dating applications like Tinder or OkCupid, and I and I consider these all to be under the umbrella of interactive media, even if most people wouldn't consider them games. But I I, I absolutely consider Tinder a game. Um, you might we could joke about what the objectives of that game are, <laughs> but uh, but it's definitely a game. And and if the and if the content is constantly being provided by users, you don't have to create it. And the users on in a dating sim will come up all kinds of interesting and, and entertaining things to write there that you just couldn't make the stuff up. <laughs> so uh, so that that makes it very cheap to for content if you don't have to build it yourself. Of course, and uh, you, I think that was a really good point you said a few minutes ago. I mean, regarding when we see that kind of freshness or variety in competitive based multiplayer, as you said, mm -hmm. uh, World of Tanks, League of Legends, where the idea is that the developer is not adding in new content. Like what, like the maps themselves you're going on aren't relatively changing, but there's enough variability in how the people are responding that greatly keeps that keeps things fresh. Like with World Tanks, for instance, whatever tanks both sides have access to greatly changes how that battle is going to play out. Yeah, no, I, I actually really like that approach. Uh, the game I just finished designing, which I still uh, still has not been announced, uh, is basically like a World of Tanks Blitz, which was one of my previous designs. Uh, but this is like more like with starships, and but with a bunch of other secret sauce added in to make it more social, because mm -hmm. the um, wargaming games are not really that strong socially. But uh, I'm trying to add in like I'm trying to add in social elements from like dating applications so that I can get the best of both worlds uh, both the user generated content and the uh, the unpredictability of gameplay so hopefully it'll be a hit <laughs> nice uh, got a quick question for you from my chat uh, Mike wants to, wanted to ask you what do you think of blockchain technologies oh we're going to get into cryptocurrencies now <laughs> <laughs> I, I have friends who, who actually um, they got their start 
as gold farmers or wholesalers for currencies that had a bunch of gold farmers working for them. And so their their expertise was basically the sale of virtual currencies. And now they're all big names in cryptocurrencies because that ended up being a really good prerequisite job for playing with these other virtual currencies like mm-hmm. uh, like Bitcoin. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I could say some things, but I'm just my 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 knowledge there is just dwarfed by what some of my friends know. Uh, so really, <laughs> there'd be the best thing to ask them. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, uh, and, and a lot of them are from gaming. They went from gaming into cryptocurrencies, which just is mind blowing to me. And they're they're making, of course, they're making, you know, thousands of times more money than I am at this point. So I have to credit them for how smart they are. <laughs> uh, getting back. Uh, to free to play and monetization then um i guess going back to or uh what we we're just talking about regarding when you're taking this game and moving it into free to play you're adding in monetization i guess what is one area that a lot of developers tend to fail in like when it comes to as we just said when you're switching from subscription to free to play and suddenly you now have to add in these additional microtransactions what do you feel is, I guess, the right way to do it versus the wrong way? And that, and the wrong way typically is what ends these games after a few months or maybe even like a year in that service. Yeah, it's tough to give you good examples of how that has been successful, but let's mm-hmm. talk about what goes wrong with that mm-hmm. uh, and why. Uh, first of all, if you're doing it, it's probably an act of desperation. Uh, your original business model or business plan was junk. And so now you're desperate and you're trying to seek a, a different solution. And the first thing to look at is if you if you have a business model uh, and you've sold it to your consumers, then that's kind of almost like a, a, a legally binding contract. It's like an, an agreement between you and your players. Uh, and even if we even if the legality of it is murky, uh, still there's this agreement that you're going to provide a certain service for a certain price. And then if you change the rules of that agreement unilaterally without the participation of the players, then oftentimes they're going to feel like they've been gypped. They've been, uh, they've been taken advantage of something that they may have been getting for free before. Now they had to pay for, uh, and they don't think that's right. Or it could be something they've paid for already. And now they're being charged for again, which, uh, <laughs> has been a real issue recently. <laughs> yeah, of course, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so that's the first deal is is when you is when you sell your product as being one thing and then do a bait and switch on them later. That's that's understandably going to cause create some ire on the part of consumers. And we're seeing this again uh, very recently. We don't I don't know if we need to name names. Anybody listening to this probably knows exactly what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so that's the that's the first issue. The second thing is if you're moving to free to play. Uh, now you're no longer even charging for the subscription, probably, uh, or you may, but it's but you've you've changed what they get now for the subscription, and this means that that people are now probably getting squeezed. Now things that they were used to just getting all the time now uh, have been made less attractive or less effective or less pleasant. Uh, they've been discomforted it, it, to try to force them to spend on these microtransactions. So of, oftentimes the, the developer actually intentionally makes their game less fun when they go to a free-to-play model in order to drive spending. So obviously you make your game less fun, then there's going to be some uh, unhappy consumers at that point. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, getting back to what we were saying earlier with uh, free-to-play games with trying to introduce those pain points or those pain barriers, I mean, it is almost like par and parcel for when a game makes that free-to-play switch, that the first thing we look at is, what's worse with the game now, and where are they going to put those microtransactions? Yeah, and once you start down the pay-to-win path, which is the most common way this is done, uh, it becomes a treadmill. Because mm-hmm. as soon as the people buy the, the, buy the win, uh, then you're no longer getting more income from them. So you either have to pay uh, a marketing cost for more user acquisition to bring in more people who might either spend or you have to bring in new content that will uh, break your contract with the players by making the win that they paid for before no longer a win. Now they have to buy a new item mm-hmm. to get the win. 
And again, uh, you've just made what they paid for before worthless. I call this equity loss. Mm -hmm. uh, people don't like to invest in something which they see as an equity investment and then have that equity turn to junk. Uh, they feel like they got ripped off. Mm -hmm. And again, with that power curve, it can just keep being extended indefinitely as long as people are willing to pay and you, you uh, breed or you uh, get that narcissistic behavior, that narcissistic personality, you can just keep extending it. But it comes at the risks, uh, or it comes at the risk of losing the people who aren't buying into that. Yeah, and then in that case, you usually have to spend a lot more for user acquisition just to bring in non-spenders to keep the spenders busy, so they have someone to hunt. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> it gets, I mean, a really good example of something like that would have been the game Evolve, which was pretty much like it became kind of the poster child to how to fail at monetizing your game and tracking people. It originally launched as a retail game, but then it also had microtransactions in terms of buying like new monsters or new characters to play with. That failed, so then the team transitioned into a free-to-play model that they completely gut and rebuilt their entire progression and monetization style, and then that failed, and then the game just went under at that point. But, I mean, it was circling the drain for, like, a good, I think, six months to a year of them trying to keep it on life support. Well, like any business, it's really important to have a successful business model. Mm -hmm. And it's also be able, um, really important to be able to identify what's a successful business model and what isn't. Um, that seems to be an unusual skill in yeah. the industry. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Because things get funded that just had no chance of success, and you just wonder who, who it was but that funded that. Uh, but again, an uh, investor probably doesn't know anything about what's going to be successful or what isn't. They just see a, a demo and think, oh, that looks cool, so this must be a game that will be successful. And those two things don't necessarily have anything to do with each other. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to trying to keep things going, keep making it alluring, I mean, this next question could probably fill an entire cast right there. But I guess in your opinion, I mean, what do you think is fair when it comes to pricing or creating microtransactions in these free-to-play games? I think the best way to look at this is uh, the consumer wants to pay for something that's meeting their needs, something that's creating value for them. So the real question as a developer is, have you created any value for your consumers recently? And if the answer is no, then what you're going to end up doing, which is what 95, 99% of the industry is doing right now, is you're going to use uh, data-driven methodology or, or other forms of business intelligence tricks to try to increase the prices of your existing game uh, without adding, without improving the the, the play experience in any way. So really what this is, is you are not adding any content, you're not improving the gameplay, but really you're raising the price of your game. And as your game matures, you're generally you're going to see, you're not necessarily going to, you're going to see probably less spending, not more. And if your idea is you're going to use computers to raise the prices of your, of your game, uh, that's, that's going to have a very limited effect. It may have, you may see the same thing you just saw with John Smedley in uh, DC Universe Online, where he bragged about a 600% increase the first month. But that's just you trying to, you know, force people to spend initially. But then that that doesn't last very long. It's not sustainable. Yeah. Uh, so usually, you know, with a little creative math, you can say, "Well, look, I I did this, and I got an increase in spending here." But what you're not measuring or or blaming on something else is is the drop in spending 30 days later from whatever you just sold. Mm -hmm. So uh, really, these are these are very desperate moves. But even su such, all this money spent on business intelligence can add millions of dollars to the cost of your game annually. Uh, so I think they tend to be very much overhyped. I think what really works is content creation. But a lot of times developers are laying off their creatives that would be engaged in content creation 
in order to pay for their business intelligence unit. Mm -hmm. uh, so you actually can't do – it's hard to do both unless you've got like unlimited money. Yeah. Uh, but if you had a little bit of money, you'd already be you'd already be you know on your yacht, and you wouldn't be trying to make more with a game, right? Yeah. Exactly. So uh, so it's all about can you make more money than you put in, and uh, and so people don't realize that when you spend more on one thing, that means you're spending less on something else. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I think you brought a really good point there with trying to keep these things sustainable. That's the magic word for a lot. Well, that's the magic word for just about any game these days with trying to keep it at the point where you're bringing more money than you're putting out. And it's very hard, especially in the free-to-play or even just in general game sense to be able to do that. Because as I said with, with DC Universe Online, they thought they could be producing expansion-worthy content every 30 days for that game. And even with infinite money, I don't think it would have been possible to keep doing that. And with the free-to-play side of things, that kind of sustainability is very tricky to do. Um, to give you a quick example, uh, the game Guild Wars 2, for instance, that they built that game entirely from day one to be a free-to-play game. They only release, I think, expansions or new content. I think it's like six months to a year. And the rest of the time, they're relying on the in-game microtransaction shop to kind of, I guess, fund that support. Well, I, I did a paper uh, doing a detailed analysis of the Guild Wars 2 economy when it came out just to show how one would even do a detailed analysis of a, of a game economy because I don't think anyone had ever, had ever done it before I wrote that paper. Um, and in this case... Uh, the developers there at Arena.net actually uh, knew how important the game economy would be uh, for that game. So, I, 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 fair disclosure, I, I was one of the first people they they started to interview. Um, but then they, uh, but then I guess you know the game econ the the gaming industry like Hollywood is very much uh, who you know, not what you know. And they end up hiring a, a famous. Uh, uh, real world economist who was trying to fix the Greek economy when it was bouncing. Um, and I thought, well, if he can fix the, the <laughs> Greek economy, he can build our game economy. Uh, well, I, that didn't work, as you can see in my analysis of the game economy I wrote, uh, my Guild Wars 2 uh, economy review. He, they laid him off after six months, and he's never worked in gaming again. Um, and, uh, and and to explain some of the things that went wrong with that, um, are, first of all, the, the, the most of the stuff that you were picking up as rewards were just junk, and they'd fill up your, your inventory, which seemed like maybe a way to, to force you to pay to have your inventory expanded, which was one of the main ways they were driving uh, transactions in that game. Uh, but actually, the, the most tedious thing in that game was just selling the junk in your backpack. Uh, another thing they would sell is is being able to remotely access the market, so that you'd have to pay for that again, to try to get out rid of all the horrible problems that were going on with your backpack. Um, and also, the uh, the items you could craft in that game weren't as good as the items you could just pick up. So, what was the point of crafting? Mm -hmm. um, and what was the point of even having an economy on that game? They they could have just given you automatically like certain items at certain progression points, uh, and it would have been a much better game instead of putting all of the, whatever the randomness it was in there because it was just junk. Uh, anyways, you want to if you want to look at the full detailed analysis, you should look up Ramin Chokrizad's Guild Wars 2 Economy Review, and you'll see um, you'll see like a lot of detail. I'll go into real specific numbers, real specific system analysis. You can see uh, what should be happening in an economy. And what was and what was actually happening in an economy? Um, a lot of it was just trying to inconvenience the player so that they would spend money on trying to deal with their inventory. Mm -hmm. um, the the rest of the game, I thought was brilliant. I thought the social systems were wonderful. I thought the fact that you could just jump in with your friends, even if they were a different level than you, oh, and yes. play because that's a big problem. You know, two players, two two friends may not be playing the same amount, and they may it'd be like a lot of pressure to not play until your friend comes on because you don't want to get ahead of them. But that was solved in Guild Wars too because everything scaled. It was it was really a sexy design I know. for that, uh, and and a lot and there was so much content 
that, I mean, some of those like uh, little mission mini games that they had were very clever and it could take you a while to really figure out how to get good at them. So for me, I could just sit there and even though uh, in a normal game, you could only do it once, there I might play the same game, you know, 10, 20, 30 times until I got really good at it and learned where to run and what to do and all the timing and everything. And there were, and there were probably hundreds of these different uh, events going on all the time in that game. So I thought it was a really, a really wonderful um, gameplay design. It's just they, they, I know because I talked to the developers that they were taking the economy seriously, but then the, what came out the other end was just not a, a serious, viable game economy. Yeah. I mean, I agree with you about the design. I thought it was brilliant about how they were they made it so you could scale everything up or down depending upon what your friends were doing, what your group was, or I'm sorry, the zone area would scale you down to whatever that level was. So you were always feeling progress, or you were always seeing it. And um, I think that was the only. I think that may be like the only like MMO style game I play that I actually got to max level at that time. And it just worked really well. I mean, we could probably spend a good 20, 30 minutes on Guild Wars 2, but I know you have to get going in probably the next uh, 10 to 15. So well, I also like that, that there was non-competitive uh, yeah. looting. You know, if, if I looted something from a tree or a rock or from a, uh, from a critter, it didn't prevent someone else from looting that same item. Whereas in World of Warcraft, if I looted a, an iron node, it disappeared and, and no one else got it. Uh, which created a real problem, uh, but there was none of that in Guild Wars. So there wasn't like, uh, in fact, it, it was actually seen as a positive thing to have more people around in Guild Wars 2, whereas the last thing you want is someone else showing up when you're trying to farm resources in World of Warcraft. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm trying to think, I mean, there's so many more questions we could easily jump into for today, but they will probably take us into like the next hour or so. But um, there is a question in chat that I think is a good one to end the cast on. But uh, one other question that I have for you, I mean, regarding making that free-to-play transition or adding in monetization elements to your game. As we said a few minutes ago, when a game makes that switch, there are some major telltale signs that you can see when that game is trying to add microtransactions. We, of course, mentioned adding in... Uh, uh, pain barriers. We mentioned, of course, uh, adding in the treadmill. But a major, major part about it is, of course, adding in premium currency. And I know last time we brought up, of course, the idea of infinite game value and trying to associate these premium currency or these premium purchases to a real world cost. I guess, in your opinion, Rami, I mean, this could also probably be its own cast again, but. Is there an ethical way of having premium currency purchases in your game? Or we may have actually answered that earlier with Path of Exile, but just to bring it back up here, what do you think about that? Well, the actual act of buying a premium currency is fairly benign. I mean, it, it yes, it creates a, a, a layer of separation, so you don't realize how much you're spending, uh, which I guess is good for the developer and maybe not so good for the consumer. But at the same time, they don't want to break that immersion, so maybe they don't really want to know how much they're spending all the time. And also, uh, it may be uh, it may be tedious for them to do a, trans, uh, a real money transaction for whatever reason. Uh, so they may only want to do that once in a while, and then they can just continue to freely spend their premium currency in between those transactions. So that's generally a good thing. What you really seem like you're asking me is, is then what should they be spending the yeah. premium currency on after they have it, uh, and again, that that all comes down to what are you selling? Are you selling advantage? If you're selling advantage, then that's going to be that's going to kill your game. Uh, but that's the most common thing that's sold is advantage. Uh, you can be selling convenience, but again, are you also giving them inconvenience to force convenience? So that's that's another area that's tricky. Um, it tends to be a slippery slope too. Uh, you can, I like to, I personally have, have, have invented some new models to get around this because I'm not really satisfied with either of those two approaches. 
and I tried to reveal those those methods for the first time in my last paper, which was consumer friendly free to play. Um, and I actually had to redact large sections of that paper because I got angry calls from um, wargaming uh, people <laughs> <laughs> who uh, told me that they didn't want me to reveal uh, any of the technologies I had invented that I applied to their game, even if I did it four years ago, because they consider those still to be high-end trade secrets. Um, so I'm wanting to tell you uh, what's the better way to do that. I tried in my last uh, 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 consumer-friendly free-to-play paper, but I would I would urge people to go look that up and uh, see what I wrote there because uh, what I didn't redact is still quite helpful if you're looking for ways around that to make uh, uh, to make your game uh, delight side your monetization model. Mm -hmm. it, one of the most obvious ways I do that that I mentioned in the paper is I create uh, uh, I in games where where both sides like competitive games where both sides are balanced, I I allow asymmetrical play in that I may get let one uh, a bigger spender bring in a bigger avatar or a more powerful avatar, but I still make sure both sides are are balanced against each other. Mm -hmm. So this keeps the gameplay fair, but allows one person to get like more attention to feel like they're a bigger deal in the battle. Yeah, I think I remember that from when I played a. Uh... Uh, world of tanks where they it was explicitly designed so that if someone had a premium tank or uh, the premium tank of course having higher stats both sides had an equal number of it so you would never uh, uh, I, I, I don't think that's part of the design I think that the premium tanks are supposed to be balanced against non premium tanks it's just they're a little easier to play maybe or that they mm -hmm. have some other n n nice things that they do but that generally they're supposed to be balanced against the other tanks uh, so, so what you're describing isn't actually happening but there was a huge uproar in May of this year May of 2017 uh, where a tank was introduced a Chrysler tank that yeah. uh, that had uh, was basically indestructible without premium ammo Mm -hmm. And this created, created a huge uproar. One of their bloggers uh, started complaining and firing off the F word and called the tank AIDS and just, you know, just got crazy. And, and this started a situation where the, the, the wargaming lawyers <coughs> that I'm <laughs> getting increasingly familiar with myself, uh, you know, came in and said that, you know, uh, tried to shut him down. They tried to do a takedown on YouTube, which could have affected his livelihood. And this caused a reaction among all the other uh, YouTube bloggers that came to his defense because they saw themselves being threatened by this movement if it became a precedent. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Wargaming had to, to do a, re a retraction. They had to apologize. Uh, for that and that and and but that but see that's that slippery slope once you start to have pay to win and and uh premium ammo which i wasn't able to remove until world of warships uh uh it, once you have it um of course you're going to make more money from it so of course you're going to put in uh, a tank that that requires you to use premium ammo because of course if you're going to sell premium ammo you're going to want to sell more premium ammo uh, so this the once if you're going to put any dark side techniques in your game, it, the game will just get more dark side over time. There's just yeah. no to avoid it. Uh, it. There's no premium ammo in World of Warships, so and 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 I use that model uh, for the first time that I just described, where you get to play a bigger thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the first time and the only time it's you've it's ever been deployed in the world was in World of Warships, where uh, you can have a battleship alongside a, a destroyer. And initially, the the they wanted to make destroyers equal to battleships, and I said, no, that's going to suck. Let's make sure, let's do it so that battleships can actually be a lot bigger. And they're like, well, then everyone will want to play battleships, and they couldn't solve that. Well, I, mean, I had solved that with this <laughs> model that I created, and then and, and thus World of Warships was, was born, and the game is is a huge success, uh, uh, despite the fact that you can play have a battleship alongside a destroyer, and people actually uh, play both. Uh, but that wasn't possible until I introduced that model. Mm -hmm. All right, I think two. Qu I think we have time for maybe two more questions, and then we'll wrap things up for today. Okay. But uh, one thing I want to uh, definitely touch on regarding premium currency or premium purchases versus the in-game one is, I guess, 
do you find that there is a right balance between allowing people to earn premium currency in games uh, to essentially allow them to eventually buy access to that stuff rather than just spending real money is that considered an example of like ethical free to play or is it still manipulating the player in the wrong way well you're you're going to be manipulating the player one way or another yeah. i mean there's no way around it but uh but especially in my more recent uh, and relatively brief foray into the casual games, it, it turns out that the more... Uh, sorry, I'm getting a phone call I shouldn't be getting. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the, the more premium currency you give them to play with, the more used to, to spending premium currency that you yeah. get. Uh, so you end up actually making more money if you're a little more generous with your premium currency. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, like speaking about like getting back to Age of Empires quickly, I know eventually after you know like right at like the end of their lifespan, they eventually rescinded and said that you could earn premium currency through play games like maybe one or two points like for like a match, but you could eventually get access to those premium civilizations. You know, it could take you a month or two of play, but it was eventually added in like that rather than just forcing people to spend real money. Well, yes, but if you can just get that, if it's if it's yeah. something that you can work, you know, put a, a 500 hours into and get, and then someone else can just hit a button and get yeah. it, then there's then you've just destroyed the equity value of 500 hours of labor. Yeah. So uh, that's people are going to feel awful if you do that, and that's why gamers recently put 750,000 players felt awful enough to sign a Reddit petition because that was going on in a very large title recently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I don't think that's a solution. Yeah, definitely. All right. I know you have to get going in a few minutes, I mean, So here is our last question. I know Mike asked this a few minutes ago, but I think this is the perfect uh, capper for today's talk. All right. We've been talking, again, about free-to-play design and, again, about how many developers these days are going, are trying to go that route. I mean, obviously, it allows you to earn a lot more money. If your game takes off and you really succeed at that games as a service, it is a very lucrative option, as we've seen in the free-to-play and even with AAA titles. But one of the, I guess, somewhat, I guess, buzz questions that have popped up over the last few months has been the quote-unquote death to single player games because so many developers or like EA and major publishers have been saying we want more online focused titles so Mike was asking are single player premium games a thing of the past are they going out of style do you have any thoughts on that Ramin I would say single player retail games are exploding in popularity on Steam from, from indie developers mm -hmm. They're, they're stepping in to fill that void for high quality games that people can play by themselves on their own terms whenever they want without having to worry about all this dark side stuff. I would say that, uh, as I mentioned in my recent uh, uh, Force Wars paper, that uh, the proliferation of dark side monetization tech has now reached 75% in the, in the free to play gaming market. Uh, well, with 75% are, are, are gearing up to use it and at least 50% have actually deployed it in the market. And so it's really a, a dark time uh, for gamers in general, which again is why I think you have this explosion of, uh, of great, high-quality, single-player uh, retail indie games on Steam. It's one of the few places in the gaming market that's actually growing right now. Everything else that's pretty much associated with free-to-play is in, is in a dire contraction at the moment. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I would definitely agree with you about the single-player side when it comes to indie games. I mean, we have seen some amazing titles over this past year, and I am sure, again, we're recording this just before the end of 2017. I'm sure that trend will continue for independent developers into 2018. And... <clears throat> I guess with that question, do you still see AAA developers or do you still see room in the AAA space for single player games or do you think we'll continue to see things kind of uh, go downward into 2018? Well, the less people, the uh, less studios are making those sorts of games, the less competition they will have. So mm -hmm. the ones that are still 
left standing after all this will do well because the consumers will have so little choice they'll kind of be forced to, mm -hmm. to buy those products. <laughs> uh, of course, that lack of competition is going to mean lower quality. Yeah. Um, so it's still a losing proposition for for the consumer, and, and it's unfortunate because it really that what what creates the greatest increase in monetization is creating product quality. Uh, if you've got a good game uh, that meets the needs of consumers, it's really easy to generate money. Yeah. Uh, but that has not been the focus of, of the gaming industry recently. Uh, this move to dark side monetization has nothing to do with improving product quality. In fact, often it involves intentionally making your game uncomfortable yeah. for consumers to force them to spend so that they'll be less uncomfortable when you're, they're playing your game. Uh, so really, we're going to have a contraction. We're going to lose jobs. We're going to lose sales until uh, we start finally getting back to giving consumers what they want, and then they'll start spending again. But in the meantime, they're going to go do other things. They're going to go to dating apps. They're going to go to Facebook. Uh, uh, they're going to you know spend their money in other places instead of on our games. If they if we continue to lower the value of the products we're selling to them. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I know we are about out of time, but that could definitely be a great topic for whenever we talk again about how we've seen these single player titles, or again, single player AAA games, trying to adopt these dark side tactics. And it is just really just like corrupting the whole, you know, like one bad apple spoils the bunch when it comes to these games. But unfortunately, I know you have to get going now and. Uh, we are certainly about out of time. So, Ramin, again, it has been a pleasure talking with you this afternoon. And hopefully after the holiday and New Year's, we can maybe do it again. It's a pleasure. I, I'm happy to do it anytime. Awesome. If you wouldn't mind hanging on Skype for like one minute after we end our little chat here, we'll be good to go. So, for you guys watching this live or recorded, thank you so much for tuning in. If you would like to watch our previous talks, I'll include links to them in the description below. If you also, uh, for those of you watching this live right now, VIP subscribers to, uh, because I'm using VIP myself on uh, patreon.com <laughs> slash GWPlacer, will be able to watch this early and without ads, but this will be going up recorded sometime, I would say probably like right around the end of the year. But again, I'm sure we'll have more time to talk into 2018. So if you're new, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. And check back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom where we examine the art and science of games. And for people who want to follow you, Ramin, are you going, uh, your Gama Sutra is still the best place to find your works? Yes, I mean, some of my most recent articles have uh, been not featured. Basically, they've been censored, uh, including that last one on consumer-friendly free-to-play. I mean, because you wouldn't want to be, you wouldn't want to see that in Gama Sutra. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> so, uh, if you want to find those articles, you got to go to Gama Sutra. You know, find me uh, as, as far as my name goes and search for the articles I've written, and that's the only way to see really my best content. Because some of my best content is also for whatever reason, not the content that they want to show on mm -hmm. Gama Sutra. Oh yeah, we could probably have a talk like that here, but I think that may get <laughs> us both in trouble. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've been talking to a lot of lawyers recently. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. All right, so I think with that, uh, we're going to end things here. Once again, Ramin, thank you for coming on, and thank you for, for you folks watching us live or recorded. Until our next stream, have a great night, and I will see you all then. Until next time, take care.